In this video, we'll start a series of several videos all talking about psychological disorders. And we're going to start today by discussing this question here. What counts as a psychological disorder? Which sounds like a simple question, but in reality is pretty complicated. Now let's uh, go ahead and kick this off with a little bit of terminology. So psychopathology, this is the study of psychological disorders, including their symptoms, their etiology, which is basically the causes of the disorder. We're going to talk about that in our next video and the treatment of psychological disorders as well. So all of this encompasses this issue of psychopathology, which is what we're diving into now. A little bit more terminology, the prevalence of a disorder refers to the percentage of people who currently have that disorder at this slice in time. Notice on the title of this slide I have lifetime prevalence because this visualization here that we're going to look at is talking about lifetime prevalence, which is a little bit different. Instead of being the percentage of people who currently have the disorder, lifetime prevalence refers to the percentage of people who get a given disorder at some point in their lives. So looking at all of this here, I'll mark a little bit on the slide. Uh, on the y-axis here, you're looking at a percentage. This is the percentage of people who get each of these different uh, DSM, we'll talk about what that is, disorders on the x-axis at some point in their lives. And notice, these are pretty common, right? Major depressive disorder, for example, about 20% of uh, women, about, let's say, 14-ish percent of men get major depressive disorder. They meet the criteria for this uh, disorder at some point in their lives, which is to say that psychological disorders are common. They are widespread, which is something we need to keep in mind. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Now let's do an exercise to get us thinking about this question of what exactly counts as a psychological disorder. I'll read brief descriptions of three different patients, and I want you to decide for yourself, what would your assessment be? Is this person basically okay? And Maybe they don't need psychotherapy, they don't need the attention of a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist. Is there a mild disturbance here where psychotherapy should be at least considered? Is there a significant disturbance where psychotherapy is definitely required? Or is there even a more severe disturbance that warrants immediate hospitalization, like if they're a danger to themselves or other people? Keep these questions in your mind as I read this three, uh, these three situations. Okay, so Bob is a very intelligent 24-year-old member of a religious organization that is based on Buddhism. And this situation has uh, gotten him into conflict with his parents, who are devout Catholics. Recently, Bob has started to experience acute spells of nausea and fatigue, so some physiological symptoms that prevent him from working and which have forced him to return to live home with his parents. Various medical tests have been conducted, but no physical causes of his problems have been found. So what's your assessment of Bob here? Just think about it as we move on. Jim, second uh, person here that we're looking at, Jim was vice president of the freshman class at a local college and played on the school's football team. Later that year, he dropped out of these activities, moved back home, and gradually became more and more withdrawn from his friends and family. Neglecting to shave and shower, he began to look dirty and unhealthy. He spent most of his time alone in his room and sometimes complained to his parents that he heard voices coming from his closet. In sophomore year, he dropped out of school entirely. With increased anxiety and agitation, he began to worry that Nazis were planning to kill him and his family. And finally, Mary. Mary is a 30-year-old musician who is very dedicated and successful in her work as a teacher in a local high school and as a part-time member of local musician groups. Since her marriage five years ago, which ended in divorce after six months, she has dated very few men. She often worries that her time is running out for establishing a good relationship with a man, getting married, and raising a family. Her friends tell her that she is getting way too anxious around men and that she just needs to relax a little in general. So what do you think about these three situations, these three descriptions? Well, in reality, all three of these descriptions are based on real cases, actual patients whose names I've changed for privacy here. So we would call all of these situations, all of these different behaviors and issues as disordered. So what specific criteria can we use to label certain thoughts, behaviors, or emotions as pathological? That is to say, as disordered. 
while several different criteria have been proposed throughout the years, but as we'll see through a few examples, there are problems and limitations with each of these criteria, at least when taken by themselves. For example, one uh, criterion that's been proposed in the past is statistical rarity. If what we're seeing is really rare or uncommon or unusual, maybe it's disordered. Well, as we've already discussed in this video, many disorders are quite common, so this alone probably isn't sufficient. Second, what if this disorder causes subjective distress? Well, this is a good one, but again, there are some exceptions here. Some symptoms of certain disorders can, quote, feel good, and I put those in quotes here uh, because these symptoms can still be very, very disruptive, but they can feel subjectively good rather than subjectively distressing to the person in the moment. For example, mania, which we'll talk about in a future video. What about societal disapproval? If society views this as, as bad or harmful or whatever, maybe that's pathological. Well, society views lots of things as, as bad or wrong or, or whatever, they disapprove of it, that doesn't mean it's all a psychological disorder. For example, laziness is generally frowned upon, but being lazy certainly isn't the same as having a psychological disorder. And finally, biological dysfunction. And this is again valid, and we see this coming up, but some disorders are learned and don't really have a clear biological component. For example, in a future video, we'll talk about specific phobias, like arachnophobia you might have heard of, fear of spiders. Well, this is a learned behavior, and we don't have evidence to believe it's biological. So again, it doesn't really work, at least on its own. So in comes the American Psychiatric Association back in the 1950s, creating a, a nice way of classifying and understanding and categorizing different symptoms into different psychological disorders. We'll talk about what that looks like in, in a second. They came up with at least four big criteria overall for something at a general level to be considered pathological or disordered. I'll read them to you and we'll touch on uh, little notes here as well. So number one, there are significant disturbance in thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Here, a disturbance means that the thought, feeling, or behavior is unusual in a particularly negative, self-defeating way. We call this a disturbance. Second, the disturbances reflect some kind of biological, which we've seen, but also psychological or developmental dysfunction. So here, the added uh, benefit to this a way of looking at things is that the dysfunction doesn't have to be biological. It can be psychological or developmental. Third, the disturbances lead to significant distress or disability in one's life. And notice distress or disability. Disability in one's life here means that the disturbance is getting in the way of the person's ability to function normally. For example, if a person has a social anxiety that's, you know, so great to an extent that they can't even go into work or they feel too nervous to go to class because of all that social anxiety. Well, that's getting in the way of this person's ability to function. That's a disability in this person's life if we're keeping consistent with this terminology. And finally, the disturbances do not reflect expected or culturally approved responses to certain events. To this final point, it's completely normal, for example, to experience great sadness or other negative emotions following you know, the loss of a loved one. And because this is culturally expected, we wouldn't consider these emotions after losing a loved one to be a symptom of a psychological disorder. So that's a little bit of an important caveat when we're answering this question of what counts as a psychological disorder. Last but not least, before ending, I want to talk about the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is how, uh, at least usually, most widely spread way of classifying mental health disorders, psychological disorders. This was again created by the American Psychiatric Association. It's gone through several different revisions, and I'll just talk about it at a very uh, general level. So as with any classification system, the DSM has its pros and cons, and I'll highlight just a few features to consider now. First of all, the DSM has good inter-rater reliability, which means that different raters, in this case, different clinicians, tend to agree on the diagnosis of a patient when using these criteria, but that inter-rater reliability is better for some disorders than for others, so something to keep in mind. A second consideration is that with the DSM, we do tend to see fairly high rates of comorbidity, which is a term we use to describe the situation in which a person has more than one diagnosis at once. 
Now, in some cases, this is very useful. For example, knowing that someone has a substance use disorder as well as an anxiety disorder. That might be great information for us to have and be able to think about. But some professionals have questioned whether we're really measuring two different disorders, if there's so much overlap between them, versus maybe we're measuring sort of multiple symptom presentations of the same underlying disorders, which is, again, something very important to uh, consider. A final consideration that I'll mention is that the DSM relies on a categorical model, one that classifies whether a person has a disorder or not. It's like a yes or no, rather than a dimensional model, like on a slider scale from 1 to 100, right? A model that asks to what extent, not just yes or no, but to what extent a person's thinking, feeling, or behavior are disordered. Might it be more effective to describe a person's symptoms on this sort of a slider scale than a yes-no scale? These are the sorts of questions that psychological scientists and clinicians and other mental health professionals like psychiatrists must continue to ask as we further develop and refine our understanding of psychological disorders.